The Starlight Lounge presents An Evening with the Progressive Box. Oh, what a great audience. Let's dim the lights for this next one. Nope, too much. Ah, there it is. Got to get things just right. Like Progressive's Name Your Price tool. Tell us what you want to pay and we help you find coverage options that fit your budget. And now, the mood is right. Wait, the lights are back on again. Trudy, can you? And now it's completely dark. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Price and coverage match limited by state law. Blog Talk Radio. show does not belong to me. It belongs to each and every one of you. It belongs to my guests. It belongs to you listeners. It belongs to every one of you all. And I am so humbled just to be the facilitator of this this show that helps people be heard in over 100 countries and on podcasts all over the world. We are now on iHeartRadio, ladies and gentlemen, under Off the Chain, as well as Southern Chats with Yvonne Mason. And I think we're fixing to get on Spotify. So, yes, we are growing like a wildfire. Now, there's two ways to get on the show. One, you can be a guest on the show, and all you have to do is send me an email at offthechainradio at yahoo.com or friend me on Facebook under Yvonne Mason. 
and say, look, Yvonne, I want to be on your show. I don't care if you just have a platform. This is what this show is about. People that are artists, authors, musicians, people with an agenda, people with a platform, people with something they want to talk about. That's why we call it Off the Chain. You can also, for $10 a month, run an ad on the show. And I will run the ad an entire month, no matter how many shows I have. Normally I run four shows a week from Wednesday through Saturday night. Your ad would run the entire month for all of those shows. And if if I happen to have a show cancellation or for whatever reason I have to cancel the show, I will give you that extra time within the next month. And it's only 10 bucks, ladies and gentlemen. I'm not out to make money. I just want to pay it forward because there's been so, so many people that have helped me down through the years. You can reach me, again, at Off the Chain Radio at yahoo.com or find me on Facebook and say, I want to place an ad, and I'll tell you how to do it. And speaking of ads, two people that have been with me for a while, I'm going to start off with their ads. One of them is Inside Your Life with CC. She is a motivational, it is a motivational, passionate conversation. CC Chamberlain interviews people who are living their true purpose, whether it be a professional boxer, an author, or a history enthusiast. CC tries to give you hope for a brighter day with her inspirational words. So download, subscribe, and listen as she guides you to pursue your dreams and for you to live your best life. This fantastic show is available on podcast.com, iTunes, Google Play, and elsewhere podcasts are available. I've been on her show, and it it was a night I was not feeling very well, and I'm going to tell you, after I came off of that show, I was invigorated. I could have grabbed the Haley's Comet and ridden with it all through the skies. She is just one wonderful, wonderful woman. Also, author Diane Moat, she is... I don't know what I'd do without this lovely, lovely woman. She writes about animals. And in her second book goes, Wherever a helpless animal whimpers in the dark, whenever the system fails to protect an animal, she'll be there, and she isn't giving up any time soon. You've been warned. When Sam Holden receives a tip about a brutal dog fighting ring, she embarks on some of her most dangerous acts of vigil antiism yet. The monster known as the puppeteer circles Sam's world as she unknowingly circles his. As they chase each other, will Sam put those she loves most in harm's way in order to bust up the ring? With time running out and animals in need, the dangerous life she's created begins to eclipse any other life she could ever lead. I can't talk tonight. Buy Diane Moat's latest book in the Sam Holden series, Dogfight, on Kindle Today. And if you haven't read How It All Started, you can begin the journey with Dog Gone by Diane Mode, also on Kindle. So go and check those two ladies out. We will have more ads as the night goes on. But I want to talk about a, a gentleman who I am so honored that he agreed to be on this show. He is an author. His name is Tony Knighton. And he is not only a lieutenant in the Philadelphia Fire Department, a 29-year veteran. He is a double veteran, ladies and gentlemen. He is also a former Marine. And I want to thank him for his service twice. First, for putting his life on the line as a former Marine and for putting his life on the line daily as a firefighter. They run into the fire while we run away. So... I appreciate him on so, so many levels. But he's published short fiction in Static Movement Online and Dark Reveres. He is also The Scavengers, was previously published in the anthology Shocklines, Fresh Voices in Terror from Cemetery Dance Publications. Sunrise originally appeared in the anthology Equilibrium Overturn from Gray Matter Press. I can't wait to talk to Mr. Tony. So without further ado, welcome, Tony, and thank you so much for coming on the show tonight. Well, thank you for having me on, Yvonne. I am just, before the show, we were talking about Elmore Leonard and and so many things in writing, but before we talk about what you have done and how you had to go about doing it. Let's talk about Tony and how you got 
into the Marines and then a lieutenant and, and then in the Philadelphia Fire Department. Was this part of your pre-planned journey as growing up, or was it something that fell in your lap? Those two things alone are worth an hour of our time, I'm telling you. No, no, there really wasn't much planned for either. Um, I was a dumb kid when I joined the Marines, and, um, you know, I, I really hadn't given that much thought. I was never a kid that wanted to be a Marine, and I just did it. Um, the fire department was much the same. Um, I was never a kid that grew up wanting to be a fireman and I was, I was working construction. I was, I was doing roofing and I just got married and I had a young son and I needed employment that lasted through the year. I was, you know, uh, winter times were always slow and, um, I heard an ad here in Philadelphia on one of the radio stations. There were, you know, um, the applications for fire, you know, Philadelphia firefighter were coming out. And I thought to myself, oh, I I, bet, I think I could do that. And uh, it's 33 years later. That, that what you read, 29, that was from 40 years ago. 33 years later, I'm, I'm still doing it. Um, and I, I just found that I really enjoyed the job. It's uh, it's the Philadelphia Fire Department has really done well by me. Well, so. all right, let let's let's back up a little bit. When you were in, how long were you in the Marines? The the usual four year oh, two, tour. No, two years. I I joined in 1972, and um, they had two year enlistments then. Um, and uh, oddly enough, most of the guys that I hung out with were also two-year men. They also drafted back then. Oh, um, yes, they did. Yeah. So, um, you know, my, my time was short. I, uh, you know, and I liked a lot of it, and I didn't like a lot of it. And, um, I, you know, I was, by the time my, my enlistment was up, I was, you know, yeah, it's time to go. Um, time to try that, other things. Well, that being said, and the reason I brought it back up is because the Marine only takes the best of the best, and the the discipline and the rigorous environment that you have to live in as a Marine, would it be fair to say that on some level that prepared you for being in the fire department because that that is a tough life. Well, I'm going to say yes, but probably not the way you think. Um, first of all, if you're if you've been in the military, you get ten points on civil service exams, and that's how you get into the fire department. And I was motivated, and uh, so I made sure I, I aced the test. And with that and 10 points, I got hired in the first batch. Um, and back when I got hired for the fire department, you prob pretty much couldn't get on the job without um, veterans preference. So everybody I, w I came on the job with was a veteran. And the officers that taught us in fire school all really liked that because he, um, he, we we sort of knew the game, you know. When when you when you get hired by a fire department or a police department, um, you go through you go through training, but it's it's more like an initiation. I mean, for me, for, for the in the fire department, we sort of learned the names of things, and we sort of learned how the organization was set up. But you learn to fight fires by getting out into the field and going to going to fires, and um, they, you know, we I think just because we'd all been in the military, we just got into the swing of things more quickly. And you also, by being in the military, you also understood the buddy system and that it was important that you had somebody always watching your six like you were watching theirs. Yeah, yeah. Well, we—I mean—in the fire service, we all 
we're all looking out for each other and the the newest guy on the job can he can make a, if he sees something that nobody else does he can make the call um i i always when i have a new guy the first thing that i talk to him about is in my own my own personal experience i went to probably the worst fire of my career with two years on the job. So I tell a new guy, you and I can be having this conversation. We could go out the door and it could be the fire of your career. You never know. So it's incumbent upon new guys to learn as much as they can, as quickly as they can, because you never know. And would it also be fair, Tony, to say that, one piece of advice to anyone that is thinking about going into that profession or any type of first responder profession, whether it be firemen, law enforcement, or EMTs, that one can never become complacent because when one becomes complacent, that's when one not only gets themselves hurt or killed, but they also put their other's life in jeopardy. Oh, oh Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I, uh, I, I recently I was talking to a guy, um, another writer, and um, he didn't really know me, but he said, oh, man, you've been a fireman for over 30 years. You must have seen it all. And I, I said, absolutely not. Nobody ever sees it all. And I can tick off five or six things that people associate with the fire service that I've never seen. Um I've never been to an oil refinery fire. Um, I've been on fires where guys got seriously hurt and or killed, but I've never seen a dead fireman. Um, you know, I'm, I'm very fortunate about that. I've never gotten seriously hurt. Nobody working with me has ever been seriously hurt. So, I know guys who have experienced all those things and their feelings about the job are very different than mine because of those experiences. And, um, but at the same time, they would say to me, I've never seen it all. Um, you know, there's, I mean, it's, it's just like life, you know, nobody, no two people live the same lives and, and no two firemen ever have the same career. In, in in making that statement, it humbles us all because if you had seen it all, you might not be here. Well, that's that's a good point. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, yeah. I mean, th- yeah. I never, think I never about thought it, that, of it way. that way. Yeah, if you had seen it all. It, it, then you might not have, because there have been, I had, okay, let's let's put it in perspective. The 42 firemen in the, um, I forget what state it was, or the 19 firemen that were the wildfire, wildfire fighters that didn't come home. Oh, yeah, home. yeah, I remember that. I remember that. Yeah. Um, that, well, that's, okay, that's a great example, because in Philadelphia, we're primarily structural firefighters. I the only thing I know about forest firefighting is that it looks like a lot of work. Um, you know, they're they're in it in there for days, and you know their their main tools are picks and shovels. Um, I you know I, I've I've fought a few fires in the woods, and they were a lot of work, but we sort of had it in a few hours. Um, you know, I, I don't know what that job's like at all. Um, and from you, what you I know, understand, but, not only are there tools, picks and shovels, but they have to set backfires to well, stop yeah, the fire. Yeah. It, yeah. What are they called? Uh, Backdrafts? Consume, consume fuel in a, in a, you know, in the direction the fire's going to, in an right. effort to try to cut it off. So yeah, they that, put their own life in danger by setting fires to stop a fire. Yeah, there's um, there's a section of uh, Philadelphia. Um, 
in the southwest part of the, the city, and uh, it's near the uh, Philadelphia International Airport. And just by the nature of things, it's it's very low lying. It's where um, um, it's a broad part in the Delaware River, and it's an area that floods a lot. So there's not a lot of construction there. And firemen basically call that part of the city the Meadows. And um, a captain I know told me that years ago he was fighting a big grass fire in the Meadows. And a guy came up to him and said, look, Cap, um, we should set a backfire. We did this in Vietnam all the time, and it will work great. And he said, well, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> so 10 minutes later, the fire was three times as big as it had been. Oh, my it word. Didn't, didn't, really, didn't really work out the way they expected he said, well, you know, remind me never to listen to you again. <laughs> but the 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 the, um, the idea was a good one, but it doesn't always work. No, 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 not at all. And and again, like I said, we're we're basically structural firefighters. So when we encounter something that we're really not used to, we're we're not used to it. So we're not very good at it. Well, I want to say thank you again, both for your service, for protecting our country and, and putting your life on the line there, and for your service and protecting your city and the people in your city and for putting your life on the line as a firefighter. To me, you have a lot of courage, Tony, and if I have a third of that courage, I'm, I am happy. Well, because, thank, thank you very much. I, I, like I said before, we we have an awful lot of fun too. So, um, <laughs> and that's true. You know, we, yeah. And and there's a camaraderie there. It's the same type of camaraderie that you built in the Marines with with the the men in your platoon. It's a brotherhood of sorts. And if if someone is not part of that brotherhood, they cannot possibly begin to understand that closeness that you all have as brothers and sisters in that brotherhood and sisterhood. I mean, if we're going to be politically correct, which I'm not. Sure, sure. <laughs> to me, it's always a brotherhood, whether it's sisters or brothers. It's a brotherhood. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I, uh, a, point of, a point of interest, I came on to the Philadelphia Fire Department with the first woman ever hired by that organization. Um that was 1985, and Philadelphia was one of the last major cities to fire departments to to hire women. So wow. I came on with the first. So you got to see history made on a whole lot of levels. I sure did. Look at you. Look at you. Yeah, Let's yeah. take a real quick <laughs> break. Let me run these last three ads because there's a lot more that we have to talk about, ladies and gentlemen. This man is fast. I could talk to him about the fire department and the workings of the fire department for the whole hour, but I know y'all want to know more. So we will be right back as soon as we run these three ads. Do you have cougars on your porch swing? <laughs> Are horses your new best friend? <sighs> Do your nicest shoes get buried knee-deep in snow as your toes turn blue? Are you bothered by wolves at your woodpile? <whistles> no, not that kind of wolf. Join wildlife artist and author Nancy Quinn and her family as they discover an exciting new life in Go West, Young Woman, a true Montana adventure. Available online and in bookstores. Or... Visit QuinnWildlifeArt.com for a personalized signed copy. Critics agree, it's a hoot. Hi, this is Winona and Jade inviting you to join us and our wonderful guests on the And I Thought Women's Cave podcast on Blog Talk Radio to learn more about our books, the And I Saw It series, and The Misfit Guides. They're available on Amazon.com and BarnesandNobles.com. Or just to see what your ladies are up to, you can find all of that out on www.AndWeThought.com. So peace and love from Winona and Jade and our books. <laughs> <laughs> Girl, you so silly. silly. You silly. 
Remember Did you write that? That's funny. <laughs> Remember to visit us at andwethought.com. Former Boston PD Captain Stanford Carter and his wife, forensic scientist Jill Seacrest, have decided to move to the Big Apple to accept positions with the New York branch of the FBI. Rookie agent Shania Deep Rose completes the trinity as they collide head-on with raging and rampant social, political, and economic unrest amid a string of murders that seem unrelated and may be serial, copycat, thrill, or hate-driven as they struggle to understand the mind and thought process of the orchestrators, killers, and victims, the team begins to wonder who's who. The line between black and white, superior and subordinate, right and wrong, and good and evil disappears as they are forced to reevaluate their own thoughts, feelings, and philosophies. Ultimately, every character must come to their own conclusions to these questions. Is justice ever more important than the law? Is playing God justifiable if it's for the greater good of all? Come along for the ride to see if Agent Carter will decide to stick to being a hunter or become judge, jury, and executioner instead. Find the answers to these questions when you read the new book, The Killing Collective. The Killing Collective is a character-driven story with big characters with depth. They're soul-searching in addition to the biggest case of the agent's careers. The Killing Collective, available on Amazon in both Kindle and paperback editions. Order your copy today. And we are back. This is Off the Chain. I'm your host, Yvonne Mason, with my guest, author Tony Knighton. And we have been talking about Tony's profession as a firefighter. He is a lieutenant in the Philadelphia Fire Department. And and he's also a a veteran. He's a former Marine, and and I am just so honored to have him as my guest tonight. Now, Tony, I, I did a deep dive on you. And I found out that that you and I think the same way about mainstream publication, and that is, as in movies and books, that what I call the big six and, and those in Hollywood, they've told us what to read, what to listen to, and what to watch for years. And now that as indie authors we have broken out with, as well as indie musicians and indie film developers, we've broken out and I think we've put them on the run and they don't know what to do with us. Would you agree with that? Oh, absolutely. Um, I think I think the the best well the best crime fiction for my money is is coming out of small presses. My my own publisher. Crime Wave Press um, is, I mean, the the stuff is just great. Uh, I'm really pleased to be published by them, and um, they they just do a good job. Um, and and there's there's a lot of other small publishers that are they're just giving chances to writers who are fabulous writers, but aren't getting looked at for one reason or another. Um, I, I think the the big publishing houses, um, they just decided instead of having a hundred books out and making, a, you know, a fair amount of money from them, they want to have six books out and make a killing on all of them, and uh, it's it's led to some, I, I, for my money, like really boring writing. Yeah. Um, but that's that's just my humble opinion. Well, and we talked about that before the show, and and the sad part that I, that I have, and I've I've been a, I'm a voracious reader. I've read since I was old enough to pick up a book. My mother taught me to read before I started school way back in the fifties. So I read anything I can get my hands on. I always have, and what I have found is down through the years, the the writers, and some of one time were my favorite writers that are published by the big six, they are put under so much pressure that if you pick up one of their new books, it's it's a continuation of a previous book. The names and places sure. have just been changed to protect the guilty. Sure, sure. I, I agree with you. I think they uh I think there isn't 
a lot of pressure to kind of write the same book, you know, to do a follow up all the time. Um, you know, that last book made us a lot of money. Write us one like that. Yeah, and, um, same plot line, same, same yeah, bat and, station. And, um, you, you know, I mean, that's, that doesn't sound like any kind of fun. No. It, because you, you, what happens, and, and we talked about this, being complacent in one's job, well, as writers and authors, that is our job. And when we become complacent in our writing, it means that we're not stretching our intellect, our intelligence, or our imagination beyond that which we think we can. So we just write the same old tired stuff and say, oh, here it is, because my name is so well-known, enjoy. And people sadly are brainwashed into buying it. Yeah, yeah. Now, I, I'm going to I'm going to qualify my last statement by saying that there are um, – serial characters that I really enjoy and, and writers that did serial characters. Um, probably the, the best example is um, the Richard Stark books and his character was um, named Parker and Parker has been done in seven or eight movies that I know about. He's never been called Parker in the movies until the last one, which was pretty bad. And um, he was done by, I think, first by Lee Marvin in in Point Blank. Uh-huh. Um, that that same story was done over again years later by Mel Gibson in Payback. Yeah. And um, um, some of the other books, but. So, um, every book kind of fits the same description. They're they're all sort of a heist gone bad. But what the guy did with that theme was different every time. It was very refreshing. Um, you know, other than the main character, there were always different characters, and the job was always different. And the things that went wrong were always different, and um, it, it just marvelous reading. And um, Richard Stark, well, Richard Stark was a pen name for Donald Westlake, and Donald could write like the Dickens, and um, just great stuff. And, and uh, you know, so as far as that sort of formula goes, um, I think it's more important to think about what you're going to do with it rather than what it is, if, if that makes any sense. Makes perfect sense because it, let's, let's go back to your profession. Okay. The, the, in, in this industry, the, the nomenclature is right what you know. Well, you could write about your profession all day long, and it would be the same profession, but every story would be different and more heightened because of your experience and the things that you've seen and done and the story, other stories that other people in other departments have told you. So yeah, while it would yeah. have the same theme, the story would be completely different with its beginning, its conflict, and its conclusion. Sure, sure. It, it's funny. I... Um... Although I, I I try to put I try to put a fire in every every book I write now. Um, it's there's only one story that I've published that really has to do with the job. And I, I wrote for a while before I wrote anything to do with the fire department. And I mainly because I I couldn't think of a way to make it interesting. And then it occurred to me like put it from somebody else's point of view. And I wrote a story called falling that was in my, my first book. It was a collection, um, happy hours and other Philadelphia cruelties that, um, was published by crime wave press. And in the story falling, it's, um, basically from the point of view of a failing real estate man who's, engaging somebody to burn down an apartment building for him. And um, I wanted, 
I wanted to write something about from the point of view of somebody who's stuck in a burning building. And um, that's probably the only really direct thing I've ever written about the job. And I wrote it from the point of view of a civilian. Um, I have a. How hard was that? Um, once I got rolling with it, it wasn't hard at all. I, I probably, I probably gave this character more credit than he was due, in that he was able to find his way around better than most civilians would, I think. But. Um, uh, and and you know I I don't want to spoil things, but his end is not a happy one. Um, but um, it I needed some distance, I think. Um, I, I a long time ago I um, I wrote most of a novel um, that had to do with a a fire investigator, and I never really finished it, so I never tried to get it published um it it kind of it was one of those things that kind of spun away from me and i didn't like the way it went and ah. rather than rather than pull it apart and rework it i sort of had other ideas by that point i i worked on something else and um uh but that's you know i mean that's sort of maybe it's, it's time to like, pull it back out because you know the characters, Tony, you've been writing yeah. long enough that we don't write the story. We're the facilitator. The characters tell us where they want the story to go. Yeah, yeah. I um, I do. I mean, there's a lot that I like about it, and I do bring it back. You know, I give it a look every once in a while. But I've got other things that I'm working on that I'm I'm happier. I'm happier with. I, I and, guarantee um, you, and, and I guarantee you at some point, the characters in that story are going to start knocking on the back of your head going, hey, hey, remember me? Hey, you're not yeah. getting anything yeah. else done. Do you, you, do you remember us? Yeah, you can't do anything else until you take care of us, and you will not be able to write another thing until you go back to that story. Well, well you know, what's, what's, um, what's interesting is I I stole – two of those characters in that book and put them in my, my recent novel, um, three hours past midnight. Um, and neither of them were major characters and neither of them are major characters in, in my, my novel, but I liked these guys a lot. And, um, uh, so I had to, you know, I, I couldn't let them rest. Um, they couldn't let you rest is what it was. Yeah. I wanna I, um, I wanna yeah. read I wanna read a, an editorial review, ladies and gentlemen, on, on we were talking about happy hour. I wanna read this yeah. editorial yeah. review and because it jumped out at me when I was going like I said, when I was doing my deep dive on you and I'm going, Wow. Just wow because all all the the things that you hear about Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love and all the positive things, this person nailed it because they said, quote, in this collection, Tony Knighton spells out one of the many reasons why I loathe the city of brotherly love. (laughs) It is crawling with people who want you dead, violently and painfully dead, end quote. And it's ginger nuts of horror, and I'm going wow. Yeah, that's that's uh, yeah, that's a, a guy that I know, and and uh, um, I, I believe John Bowden wrote that. Um, he's a he's a really great writer too, and he he lives out, um, um, I believe, in the Harrisburg area. I could be wrong. Um, I've only communicated with him through email. And he's a swell writer too, but um, yeah. he, he he wrote that, and I, I I was screaming laughing the first time I saw that. But um, that was, and then and then literary flits quote Tony Knight enables the city of Philadelphia to almost become a character in its own right in many of the stories. 
its dark presence adds a great sense of menace to a cast of already dangerous characters and really brings out the realism in this short story collection, end quote. I have to get this book, Tony. These people have sold me. Well, yeah, sure. Because this is absolutely absolutely amazing. Because, and, and, and the second review is right. The setting has to become a character within its own right in order for the story to to breathe its own life. Well, I, I you know, I um, I agree, and I never, I never consciously set out like you know thinking, um, you know, thinking consciously as I wrote it. Well, you know, I'm going to make the city as as important as everything else, but it. It's where I've spent probably ninety percent of my life, and um, I don't think I could have turned out a different kind of story without Philadelphia playing a, a big part in it. Um, well, you've, it seen uh, a, you've seen a lot of the underbelly of the city, as well as a lot of good of the city. I'm sure. Yeah, you know what's what's really interesting about being a, a cop or a fireman that occurs to me over and over again um, is that we go to these places in the city that only little kids go by choice when they're playing, uh-huh. little boys. Um, the interstitial spaces, the, the undeveloped space, like the railroad right-of-ways and um, – the green spaces under an overpass and you know the um places where there's no point in being unless it's your job or unless you're a little kid playing a game and um you know we're like the only adults that mess around in places like this um and it's it's given me i don't know i i i've gotten I've gotten a look at my hometown in a way that I don't. I think most of its residents never see. Um, plus, I've worked all over the city, and uh-huh. and one of the big things, one of the big things for um, critically important things uh, about being a fireman is you have to know where you're going. So you you have to know the neighborhood. You have to know other na- you know the neighborhoods around where you're working, and uh, it takes a long time to do that. And uh, it's when you when you can hear an intersect you know intersection of two streets, and you can picture it almost yeah. anywhere in town. It's it's I don't know. It's a um, it's a neat feeling. It's like you're your own walking GPS. Yeah, kind of, kind of. And, and another thought that crossed my mind is a fire is no respecter of person, status, sex, gender, um, ethnicity, race, sexual no, preference. No. A fire no. is a fire yeah. from, from the richest neighborhood in the city to the poorest slum in the city to whether or not you're homosexual, whether or not you're homophobic, whether or not you're in <laughs> any other of the names that go floating around that I hate, a fire is no respecter of persons. A fire destroys, kills, maims, and obliterates lives as well as property, yeah. businesses, homes. And you have seen much of this, and like I say, you haven't seen it all, but you have seen much of this in your life, and to breathe that kind of life into the book and make Philadelphia a character is just phenomenal. Well, I'm glad you enjoy that. I, uh, I, it's, uh, it, it, it is, it is what I know, and, um, I, uh, I've, I've written – it's interesting because I've written a few stories that have been published that aren't set in Philadelphia. But um, the two that I'm thinking of, um, I, I, the, the Scavengers is a story that takes place in 
um, in Namibia, in, in Africa. Um, it's about uh, basically the uh, illegal ivory trade. And um, the, um, the protagonist, I, I just call him Jimmy, and never mentions it, but I know that he's from Philadelphia. There's no mention made in the story. I know that he's from Philadelphia, and I even know what neighborhood he's from for some reason. Wow. Um, and, and, you know, and it, it really doesn't make any difference there's, to anybody but me, but I know that's where he's from. He, you know, he's from Olney in Philadelphia. Um, and, and, you know, I don't know why I know that. Um, the other story um, – was a short story in, in happy hours was called Mr. Wonderful. And it doesn't even mention what state he's in, but you know, the guy's away from where he belongs. And, um, you know, in my mind, I knew exactly where he was and I knew where he was from, you know, he was from Philadelphia, but I never mentioned it. Um, and that story, the protagonist, um, unfortunately, I didn't give him a name, um, and or, or fortunately, depending on how you, you feel about that sort of thing. But um, he he survives that story, and um, he was injured, and I realized that by the time he gets well, he's going to need to go back to work. And I, my next book, I wrote a novel about him three months after uh, the story of Mr. Wonderful. He's healed up and he, he needs a job. And um, it, uh, it, that, that takes place in Philadelphia. But the first story never even, you know, he was a hundred miles away and, um, you know, just needed to, needed to get back. And, uh, again, in my, I was the only one that knew where he was and where he was from. And it was probably only important to me, but you know, that's, it's just how those things go. Sometimes it's, it's funny. And, and probably unconsciously he, he also knew because he, like I said, we're only the facilitators. He also knew that he was going to make you write the second story and put him back where he belongs. <laughs> Possibly, yeah, I, 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 uh, I, I started. That was uh, that was a really unusual story for me because I really didn't have any idea of what was going to happen. It started with a visual, and that was um, of a man stuck in a car that's been wrecked and it's sitting upside down in a shallow stream and he comes to and he knows his collarbones broken from the, uh, from the seatbelt and above him on the road above him, he hears a, a siren go by. And that was all I knew when I started that. I just thought that that's a predicament. Yeah. And, um, and I, you know, I, I just took it from there. You know, well, what's he going to do? Well, he's got to get himself out of the car. And, you know, then what's he got to do? And, you know, and, and it just it just sort of went like that. And it was really fun to write, um, figuring out what this what this guy's going to do and, and what's going to happen to him. And uh, I, you know, by the time I was done, finished with the story, I realized I really like this guy. He's really smart. <laughs> So uh, I I had to write something else with him. So I well now I, I want I think... to I want to I don't mean to interrupt because we're going to run out no. of time. But I want to sure. read the synopsis of your latest book, Three Hours to Midnight. No, ladies and gentlemen, you can't go yet. the The newest book that Tony's released is called Three Hours Past Midnight, and it goes like this: His last job a disaster. A professional thief teams up with an old partner eager for one last score. A safe in the home of a wealthy Philadelphia politician. But they are not the only ones set on the cash. His partner dead and the goods missing. He hunts for his money and the killer to find out that this may have been a job best left undone. Now you have already grabbed me. 
and the synopsis. Well, I'm because so glad. that kind of book is right up what my alley. I I don't know if you know anything about me. My uh, background is criminal justice, and my husband is is retired law enforcement. So this is oh, the kind of stuff cool. that we read. Yes, I was a bounty hunter in a former life. Wow. That's <laughs> yeah. Neat. Yeah. Well, I, it, it, I just about everything I write is from the point of view of the criminal, from the bad guy. Um, I, 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 I realized it would be, it's, it's just more fun for me because as you well, well, you know better than I, there are legal constraints as far uh-huh. as what a, a policeman or policewoman or, or a bounty hunter or anybody, any of the good guys, they're, they're constrained by, you know, constrained by, by legalities and laws. And, right. um, and I, plus I don't know enough about police work to write accurately from the point of view of a, a policeman or, or a law enforcement professional, but from the criminal's point of view, it's, it's fair game. They can do whatever oh, they anything. want. They're criminals. And yeah, anything um, you, you know, can imagine so it, happening, you can make happen. Absolutely, and and I, um, I, I made a rule for myself that I would never have a character do something physically that I couldn't do in my twenties, at least. Um, some of my characters do things that I couldn't do now, but <laughs> I, I would have been able to do them, and. I try as much as possible to talk. If there's a, a subject that I don't know about, I invariably seek out a person who does, rather than than look out look up stuff on the internet, the internet rather. Um, I talk to cops. I've talked to lawyers. I uh, I talked to a judge one time about something. Um, I one of the first experts I ever. Um, approached was a friend of mine who's a locksmith and he thanked me for asking him he said it drives me nuts when I'm watching a show on TV or a movie and a guy picks a lock with one hand he says it just makes me bananas because you can't do that it's exactly. there's two tools and um, and I, I try to research this stuff myself physically I uh, I I really enjoy talking to my friend Pete the locksmith, but eventually I wanted to see how hard it was to pick locks myself. So I bought a set of picks and started messing around with them. And now I, I can I can get myself into a simple lock, um, which makes me feel a lot better about writing about somebody else do that. Uh-huh. Um, you, you know what I mean? I'm not just I'm not just excuse pardon my expression. I'm not just pulling it out of my ass. Exactly. Uh, uh, you know, I I know I know a little a little bit about it anyway, and I know which locks are hard. You know, so um, it, and it, it just makes the whole process a lot of fun. And you made a statement that that resonated with me because my husband and I watch a lot of of um, TV shows that that have the police element to them. And we both sure. catch ourselves, and it's in movies, and we both catch ourselves saying, okay, remember, this is just entertainment. It's not real <laughs> life. They're screwing up, but it's okay. It's just, in, don't overthink this. <laughs> so yeah, I understand. And, and sure. Uh, and, and the reason it's sad is because it's taken you out of the game for a few seconds. You weren't able yeah. to suspend reality. And sometimes sometimes you have to do that to a few people who are going to know better but if it doesn't matter why not just get it right exactly. and oftentimes or, or or why doesn't the writer just work a little harder um that stuff makes me nuts because um i, I just like you i, I mean it, it takes you out of the game for a minute mm-hmm. and um and I don't want to be taken out of the game. I want to enjoy myself. I want to believe this story. That, yeah, just and it, it's in books too. And I and I I find myself wanting to throw the book across the room because I'm going. They would never, ever, ever do that. <laughs> yeah. 
I I know what you mean. I've um, I've sailed a few books a few good distance from time to time. <laughs> you get it. <laughs> yeah, now, yeah. Let me. Let, all right, now, so what I need, we're going we're gonna to run out of time. So before we run out of time, tell no, y'all can't go yet. Tell the folks the name of your books and where you can be found. And then before you do that, would you be willing to come back with a new book? Because I have had so much fun talking to you. Oh, absolutely. I've had a ball. This, is, this has been <laughs> a guess. I, I, I'd be honored to come back on your show. I'm sure it's not like an interview you've ever had before. <laughs> <laughs> it certainly we, is not, and and um, they, everyone I've had has been different, and they've all been fun, but they've all been fun in a different way, and I I like your style. Thank you. Thank you very much. So tell the folks about your books. Tell them where they can be ordered. Tell them where they can find you, because I know folks are going to start buying your books real quick. Well, the, um, my my books are – Happy Hour and Other Philadelphia Cruelties, which is a, um, a a novella and a lot of short stories. It's a collection. And my novel is Three Hours Past Midnight. And they're both published by Crime Wave Press. And the, um, the easiest way to get a hold of any of my stuff is to go to Amazon and type in Tony Knighton and – um, my stuff will pop right up. I, you know, and a few the anthologies that I've been included in, and um, um, a couple of other short things. But um, from there, I, you, I, there's an author page, and I think it will take you to my site, which I think you can find just by typing Tony Knighton into Google. Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. It's uh, www dot tony knighton dot com um and uh you know that that'll kind of tell you most of what you need to know about me and you also what i've written correct? um yeah but i i'm very spotty on facebook i uh i'm on facebook oh, and on twitter but we have but, to but talk also, tony we have to do you because see if you integrate Twitter to your Facebook page, everything you put on your Facebook page automatically goes to Twitter, and that is the best marketing tool out there. I I know, right. but I um, you know, like I'll go months without looking at my Facebook page <gasps> just because, uh, just because the, Satan bad. <laughs> the, yeah, but the the nicest people I know are so nasty when they get on Facebook. Uh, I, I don't know I what it them. is. I ignore those. I don't people. know what it is, but but um, but you're you're absolutely right. Um, mostly, what I've gotten from Facebook is I have gotten to meet other writers, and I found out that there there really is a scene, and um, I've met some of these people physically, but but mostly I I know them from communicating on Facebook, and I'm very happy with Facebook for that. Um, I've gotten to know other men and women in the game. And that's that's a cool thing. So see, and and this is how I promote your show. And the reason I say you got to stay on Facebook is because after tonight's show is over, I will put the link for the archive show up. I tag you in it. I hope you and I are friends. If not, we will be. Then oh, tomorrow, absolutely. I put the the show up on I. Uh, Spreaker, SoundCloud, MixCloud, Podcast.com, Podcast Garden. From there it goes up to iTunes, FM.com, TuneIn Radio, iHeartRadio, YouTube, and several other podcasts that I don't touch. So you have all these avenues to promote. Offer- well, well, you know what? I, I promise you I'll look at Facebook tomorrow. Okay. And if... Uh, if I haven't friended you before, I'll friend you. Sounds like a plan. So, ladies and gentlemen, we are getting to the end of our hour, and I want to thank Tony for coming. And I know he's going to be writing another book. And, yes, we will bring this wonderful young man back because I've had a ball talking to him. But I want to say this at the end of our show, like I always do. People will forget your name. They will forget They will even forget what you're wearing. But they will never, ever, ever forget how you made them feel. And it is my goal with this show to make every guest and every listener 
feel so special that when they go away, they can't wait to come back. Because people have been kind to me when I was at my lowest ebb, and there's nothing more important than passing that along. So, Tony, I hope you will come back. Thank you for being on the show. Don't hang up when the show goes dark because I want to talk to you for a few minutes. But, ladies and gentlemen, sure, sure. join us Wednesday night at 8 o'clock Eastern Daylight Time when we start off a whole brand new week with Off the Chain. And, I, again, I want to say thank you for listening and thank Tony for being here. And with that, author Tony Knighton and I, your host, Yvonne Mason, from off the chain, wish you all a good evening. Okay, so if if you haven't already friended me, friend me, and because this is my gift to you, my friend, this show in archives and all the podcasts that it goes up on, and and I, we're fixing to go up on Spotify too. Oh, cool. And we're heard in over 100 countries. Oh, and we are, with all of the um, all of the podcast plus the show, we are almost to 140,000 listeners. Wow. And 100 that's, that's countries. That's a lot. Yeah. That's a lot. That's why I say, uh, stay with me on Facebook because you will be heard. I will. I will. I, uh, you know, I, um, like I said, I, I mean, seriously, some of the nicest people I know are, are raving lunatics once they get on Facebook. And I don't, I don't know why they do that. And I, I, because um, they can be remain, they can be autonomous. Well, yeah, you're right. It's like, it's like road rage. You know, you'll, you'll, Mm -hmm yell and, and say things to people in another car that you would never say to them face to face. Um, but it, it's, uh, you know, I, um, uh, I, I just, every once in a while, say, you know, life is too short for me to be looking at this screen. And, and I, you know, I, I don't go back on for a while. Well, well but, if you uh, don't look I, at I anything, look at mine, because I will tag you in everything that has to do with you. In fact, I've been tagging you all week. About this show, oh, cool. hoping that you would um, promote it because that's how you get listens. Yeah, that's how well, you I, get. I will. I will. And um, you know what? I'll tell you something. I I really quickly got on it this week because a week ago this Saturday, I met my half sister. Wow. I I. You know, I mean, we knew each other existed, but I never met her. And um, I found out some things, and I, I I reached out to her, and we got together th- last Saturday, and um, and and it, it was, you know, it was everything that you thought it would be, but it was more because um, I found out I really like her, um, you know, which is which is a plus because you don't always like your siblings. Maybe it's because That's we didn't true. grow up together, but. Um, yeah, she's a sweetheart, and and um, she we've been we've been texting, and she sent me a text and said, "Hey, I sent you a friend request, and, you know, and you didn't answer me." I was like, "Oh my god!" So I'm like, "Yeah, okay, I'll I'll rev up the computer, and you know, I'll 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 confirm your you know your friend so request." So it's nothing but, more uh, than for her because you don't want to lose yeah. her again. Oh no no we, we we're. We're thick as thieves now. Um, now you were you, uh, you're writing another book, correct? Yeah, yeah, I am. Um, it's, when do you plan uh, to release it? Well, I'm not finished. So, and I I write kind of slowly. So, um, I well, don't stay know. Stay in I'm, touch with me. Stay in touch with me because I want to bring you back and launch your book on the show. Well, cool. It, it'll be within a year. Uh, you know, okay. I'm, I'm uh, you know I. I I can see the whole story in my head pretty much. So um, things tend to go more quickly at that point. And, uh, you know, then of course, if, uh, if somebody likes it and wants to publish it too, you know, um, there you go. Well, I'm all, sure you won't have any problems with that. Dunk, so. yeah. Well, yeah. with that, I am going to say thank you again for appearing on the show and watch well, your thank page. You. you are quite thank welcome. You for, it was a hate. Yeah. I love it. It was so much fun. 
Yeah, me too. This this went really quickly. Like when you say uh, it, it always does. the end, I thought I thought that can't be. We've only been talking for <laughs> fifteen minutes. <laughs> my my shows go that fast because what I do is I bring out the best in my guests, or at least I hope I do. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. And and it's just like you and I are having a conversation. It's not really a radio show. It's just you and I having a conversation about shared interest, me learning new things and pulling those out of you and the hour just flies by. Yeah, yeah. Well I learn new things too, you know, so <laughs> it's all good. All right, my dear. Well I'm gonna get back to my husband and I will get this show up in archives and tag you in it. And C Henry's gonna also get tagged in it and then tomorrow when I post all of it in the podcast I will tag you in those, and I want you to take those and share them with everybody you know, because everybody needs to hear this show. I will. I will. And tell your husband to be safe. I will, dear. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. The Starlight Lounge presents An Evening with the Progressive Box. Oh, what a great audience. Let's dim the lights for this next one. Nope, too much. Ah, there it is. Got to get things just right. Like Progressive's Name Your Price tool. Tell us what you want to pay and we help you find coverage options that fit your budget. And now, the mood is right. Wait, the lights are back on again. Trudy, can you? And now it's completely dark. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Price and coverage match limited by state law. The Starlight Lounge presents An Evening with the Progressive Box. Oh, what a great audience. Let's dim the lights for this next one. Nope, too much. Ah, there it is. Got to get things just right. Like Progressive's Name Your Price tool. Tell us what you want to pay and we help you find coverage options that fit your budget. And now, the mood is right. Wait, the lights are back on again. Trudy, can you? And now it's completely dark. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Price and coverage match limited by state law.